this is a palm tree. We're looking at the Middle East here. And in the middle of this plain is that funny kind of hill. Now this is called a tell in the Near East, which is a series of civilizations built one on another. For some reason, when one town, one army built burnt down another city, they just build another one on top of it. And so it's an archaeologist's delight because in the same place you get layers of civilization. So let's, let's just uh, have a mock-up of that. And here it is. This is that on now isolated so that we can discuss it. So the where would an archaeologist begin? Obviously at the top of the pile. And he would throw away the shards and the dust and dirt and send the, the beautiful mosaics and pots and pans to the British Museum. And then take a, take a little year off and come back and do the next layer of civilization and so on until he came down to, I guess, the Stone Age where the first city dwellers finally built a home. And in each one of these levels, there are precious treasures to preserve and junk to be, you know, thrown out. Uh, now, it seems to me that, that this model, the archaeological dig, is, is very similar to the divine therapy. In other words, the, the Holy Spirit takes us where we are right now whenever you're converted, decide you're going to pray, uh, decide you're going to give yourself to a serious pursuit of the truth, the divine life, however you, you uh, extrapolate that in your own mind. So, so the first stage then might be called the, the springtime of the spiritual life, or in religious life it's called the, uh, the uh, what is it called? Fervor. Fervor of the novices, yes, thank you. I've been a while since I was a novice. <laughs> so what happens at that at moment is that one begins to get interested in scripture, the person of Jesus Christ, if it's a Christian conversion. The sacraments get more interesting. One begins to have a daily time for scripture reading or prayer. One meets nice people. One goes to bingo. One <laughs> contributes to the support of the pastors. It maybe gives a great donation to the propagation of the faith. Buys Christian, uh, reads the NCR and uh, other nourishing journals for your piety. And so, so you get all excited about the spiritual journey, and and. Uh, and it's, and it's a real beginning that you hope is going on forever. Well, then, then, then comes the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit decides, well, this guy or this gal it, it, it seems to be ready for our next excavation. And so he, he begins to look at this period in our life, which depending on when, when the conversion began, might be old age, midlife, early life, even adolescence. And, and so in, in the transition from one stage to another, obviously you lose the great treasures in some degree you were enjoying here in, or, in order to start digging, and the digging is, is sweaty and hard work and so on. And, and, and so let's say this is late, late adulthood in here. Uh, and, and so the painful experience is that all, all the good things that one was enjoying with a great deal of emotional fervor begin to dry out in some way. I think John of the Cross calls this the night of sense, so that you no longer can meditate easily, or you get tired of conversing with God, or the, or the spiritual reading of the scriptures is like reading the telephone book. and. Uh, uh, you, you run into other troubles, your spiritual director goes away or, or dies or, or you have an altercation with your superiors. Uh, uh, everything starts to go wrong, in other words, and, and one begins to feel, well, maybe, maybe this isn't going to work. The spiritual journey must be for the Trappists and Carmelites. It's not for me. I'm just an old slug of clay here. And, 
I never was any good anyway, and here's where the low self-image comes in and says, well, I'm not for God, and I'm just, a, you know, uh, a worm and no man, and so on. This is the worm theology you heard about earlier. And so if you're in religious life, it could be reinforced by all those great cliches. <laughs> Renunciation, is, the words of renunciation were never meant for people with a low self-image. Never give those stuff to them, because they'll misinterpret that. And, and, then, and still let's talk about the higher states of consciousness and no self, because no self is just what they want anyway. It's too heavy a burden. So that's not the no self that the Buddhists are talking about, or or the higher, higher ranges of transforming union in which the self becomes less and less an I and more and more of, of Christ's life in us. So, so this is a very disconcerting period in the spiritual life. But uh, it, it, the spirit doesn't stop there. There's usually a plateau in which one begins to see that in spite of all the uh, aches and pains of that of losing the, the joys of, of the first conversion, there are some very real benefits. For instance, one becomes less judgmental. One doesn't regard oneself as an elite person. One doesn't condemn the other people who don't have quite the same observance. If you're a Trappist, you go a little easier on the Benedictines. <laughs> if, if you're a Dominican, you, you know, you don't say the same swear words about the Jesuits and so on. And so. I, I suppose this happens in, in the congregations of women, too. I don't know them quite so well. But, so the spirit re is relentless because uh, once we enter this conversion, uh, the spirit presumes that we're interested in this project. Uh, it's as if you hire the spirit as your therapist, and you agree to your interviews, which are the prayer periods, and so there begins this serious investigation of your entire personal life history beginning now and working layer by layer. Now, now agreed that the spirit sometimes skips a few layers or turns things upside down, but normally, this is a guideline again, <laughs> normally there's a certain progression beginning where you are and then dealing with where you are next, like he might uh, suppose this is the midlife crisis. So he goes through that and throws out things that should have been, never have been there in the first place, and, and he saves what was beneficial at that age. Then we're back into, uh, let's say, uh, early adulthood. Each of these periods of life have great values, but, but what we did with them under the influence of our energy centers, which were seeking happiness in the wrong places, could have distorted the values of that period. So, so the spirit is healing everything and, 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 and never, never denies anything that was good in our whole life and even makes use of our mistakes and sins to help to purify us and to, to bring us to uh, humility and interior freedom. But, but notice, each time we go to another level, there's something of a crisis of faith because God seems to disappear from our, you know, the usual relationship we were having and our usual devotions and so on. And, and so they can be more or less disconcerting. But relentlessly and lovingly, the Spirit keeps digging. And so whenever you, the Spirit seems to disappear or whenever you're in tough shape, it doesn't mean that God is angry or has gone away or that you're no good or that you don't know what to do next. You just sit it out. You just wait it out. And sure enough, when enough digging has been done, you find yourself at the next level, which is a kind of plateau with a new level of freedom, peace and joy and capacity to serve others. Now, there's one serious problem here, and that is as, as, the, as the divine light uh, stronger than any laser beam, begins to get into early childhood, say before three or four and, and back, the psychological experience, what's it going to be? That you're getting worse. And, and this is very disconcerting for holy souls who have been struggling to practice the virtues uh, with some but not complete success and who are experiencing 
the, a recycling of some of the problems that they thought they had dealt with up here. In other words, a relationship that never quite healed gets scratchy again. A temptation that was never quite resolved but seemed to be quiet <laughs> rises again. Or, or some new things occur because we're getting down towards early life where the motivation is more, uh, was more hidden from us because of repressive apparatus. And we begin to find out that we're basically a, an angry person or a hostile person. Uh, not to mention a prideful person. Or, or maybe you, you hit, a, hit a level, let us say, you, you pass through once again the age of puberty and all the sexual energy of that uh, period that you might have successfully repressed, in, more or less, begins to, to explode into your life. And so it's a little embarrassing in, in your late 50s to be dealing with adolescence. But fortunately, it doesn't take so long at that age. But any number of people in, 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 in religious life and maybe married life, I guess, and who, who were taught of the risks of mortal sin in such a degree that even their, my, the smallest thought would land you in hell, uh, that, that these people are terribly repressed. And, and maybe successfully, the last place they should enter is a seminary at this state until they so they've resolved their psychosexual maturity in some degree. That's why I'm happy to see that people enter religious life in the priesthood older. If, if, they, if they took my advice, no one would enter um, uh, the sunny side of 40. And 45 would be preferable. <laughs> it would be good for everyone to go through the midlife crisis before making a permanent commitment to celibacy. Because I don't know that you'll make it, frankly. <coughs> <coughs> And, and I've seen the most tragic situation, the terrible scruples for the most wonderful people on earth are just tortured by scruples that they were in, got in early life. Or again, you know, very, uh, you know, excellent people or all kinds of things who had so successfully repressed their sexuality in a minor seminary or similar circumstances that they, they didn't even know their sexual orientation. And, and at 55, either through humility, because <laughs> the, uh, the prideful reasons for behaving have all now worn away by the wear and tear of life, or uh, it, 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 it just crashes through their defense mechanisms and they may spend several years almost hopelessly at the mercy of, of, of lustful feelings and perhaps activity. And, and, and these are the very best people. So they, they, they've, been, they've been betrayed by the system in which sexuality uh, and, uh, was never taught adequately in seminaries and, and perhaps even in, in Catholic schools. Well, something is beginning to be done in that area, but still very little. And I think some of the tragedies we're hearing about in the press at this point, uh, I mean, are, are due directly to a failure to provide adequate uh, semin uh, seminary formation in what is the most important energy in human life, which is sexuality. It has to be dealt with. If it isn't in early life, it'll simply explode in your 50s and perhaps 60s to the great detriment of one's, uh, one's self-confidence and one's, uh, perhaps one's ministries. And, and, I, and I think that married couples uh, suffer somewhat similar if one of them has been through repression or, or perhaps sexual abuse. Uh, I mean, someone who has suffered from sexual abuse needs a lot of therapy in order to be able to, to lead a normal sexual life, and to be able to give themselves to someone else uh, in, in sexual love as is appropriate. So, so wh what I'm saying is that there are all these deep emotional wounds that have been unaddressed in early life begin to be addressed when there's a sufficient rest in the mind and body and trust in God through the increasing experience that this therapy works. In other words, one begins to love God and trust God so that you're not afraid of what comes up. And perhaps the bottom line is when it doesn't matter to you what comes up, you're pretty close to divine union at that point. Because th this 
it, we are exactly who we are with all the damage we've brought with us from early life and the, whatever we've added. And this is what God is working with. And this, it seems to me, is what the cross of Christ really is. It's, it's who we are with our wounds and uh, God is asking us to bear that for the love of God and that, that God will help us to gradually climb out of that in some degree. But if we don't finish the job, it doesn't matter because basically the Christian perfection is love and nothing else. And so if we love our weakness, our frailty, even our sinfulness for the love of God, in other words, if you can't get over it, I love that and let that be your service of God because God has come to live with sinners and so we, he seems to prefer them, if anything. <laughs> So maybe he wouldn't like us if we were perfect. He'd be bored to tears. There'd be nothing to do. But there's not much danger of that happening in <laughs> one lifetime. <laughs> so, so it's very important then for holy souls, I say those who've been in religion a long time or on the spiritual journey, to remember that as you feel worse, as the more primitive emotions arise, as thoughts you never thought you could possibly have entered your mind when you started out the religious life. When these start coming to mind, raw anger, grief, despair, lust, uh, apathy, uh, etc., <laughs> all the capital sins, when, when these appear in, in your awareness in, in, in uh, primitive and raw forms, then rejoice you're getting to the bottom of the pile. And just wait a few years, and when you're at the bottom of the pile, where are you? You're in divine union. There is no other obstacle. God is there waiting for you and has been directing you to that point, urging you to come there, and changing not so much your habits, but your attitude. In, in Christianity, motivation is everything. And it, it, it's an attitude of, of, of a loving acceptance of, of, of our disabilities, our handicaps, who we are, uh, the person we're married to, the community we have to live in. <laughs> this world in which we have to live, they might drop a bomb on us, they might shoot you as across the street, <laughs> wind up in the hospital, get AIDS, all the rest of it. It doesn't matter. It's all... It, it's all God's particular love for us, and it's the accepting and welcoming, which is the, the idea that, uh, that the open mind, open heart has added. In other words, Kassad recommended accepting everything that happens and abandoning. The open mind, open heart practice that Mary Mazowski uh, developed with her associates at Christmas is it's not just to accept it. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, oh boy. This lovely headache, welcome, my broken arm, uh, my t terrible divorce. Praise the Lord. I mean, it, it's, it's the attitude towards daily life where the kingdom is most powerful. And, and, and I don't know that you can get there without being willing to descend this archaeological dig. And, and the dig gets pretty deep as you get older and as you surrender, to, as you agree to it. And from time to time it may need a little psychological help. The final doc, uh, diagram is a dynamic view of the horizontal and vertical models because life is, is life. It doesn't just get categorized. And I think the best model to describe the spiritual journey is not hierarchical, God forbid, or a ladder, or for that matter, a, a circle. It's a spiral staircase. And I'd like to leave you, uh, when we come back next time, with a thorough discussion of the spiral staircase as the process of the divine therapy in its most uh, integrated and complete form. Thank you.